EMP series, book three, Revolution, episode one. Blessed be the Lord, my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. My goodness, my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and he in whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. Psalm 144, verse 1 and 2. Sunday morning, Carl and his family sat in their usual spot during the church service. Pastor, at the podium, preached a biblical message to the crowd. In summary, today, brethren... Our text verses from Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 8 through 12, has a practical application in our lives. During these difficult, trying times we find ourselves in, we can take solace in God's word. No one of us is alone. We see in these verses of scripture the importance of of having others to help support and stand by us in difficult times. We can lean on each other and draw strength from God and from one another. As it tells us in verse 12, two are stronger than one. Look around this sanctuary, people. This is our family. We must look to our Heavenly Father to be the third strand in that cord. Together, with God's help, we will not be defeated. Let us draw upon his strength to help us persevere in this uncertain world. Let us pray. Holy Spirit of God, be with us all as we make our way from this place today. Help to guide and strengthen us in our walk with you, Father. Keep us safe and prosper us as we seek your divine intervention in our lives. Please continue to bless and bring us back at the next appointed time. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. And all God's people said, and in unison the crowd shouted back, Amen. The congregation is dismissed. Pastor stood in the lobby to chat with everyone as they slowly filed out. He shook hands and visited with the congregation for some time before returning to the rear into his office. Back at the Fairley homestead, the citizens were starting to gather for the meeting which was to be held in Carl's barn. Tyler Hobbs and two of his men were the first to arrive. They came up the dirt road on their old dirt bikes, and Carl heard them approaching from a way off. Zeb and his brother were splitting wood on the side of the house where the driveway ended, and they told the visitors to go out back to the barn where the meeting was to take place. As others started to arrive, Zeb and Zach showed them back as well. Hollis Bellows and his 24-year-old son, Nate, rode up on horses and headed straight back. Lou Webb and his brother, Charlie, arrived in their old 1962 Chevy pickup truck. Before too long, there were 11 people in attendance, along with Carl. Carl stood and walked to the front of the group. He thanked everyone for coming and outlined his plan to send the petition to the governor of the state, asking him to rescind the martial law order and to remove Major Stillman and his men from this region. Hollis Bellows told the group how a couple of Stillman's soldiers showed up at his farm a few days ago and took three pigs. They issued him a receipt and told him that at some future date, a government agent would set up an office in town and would seek to pay out on all the receipts for the things that they had been commandeering. 
Bellows was not given the option of refusing them, or even the chance to negotiate the price for the pigs. Lou Webb said that he'd heard of similar stories from his neighbors also. Major Stillman and his men were just going around taking what they wanted and justifying it with the need of his troop survival. The citizens were all given no options but to acquiesce and to take the receipts with the promise of some future undisclosed amount of remuneration. Hollis pointed out that the three pigs they took were promised to one of his neighbors as payment for a weekly share of fresh produce. Produce that Hollis and his family had already been receiving. Now I can't pay off on it. I gave them my word that they would have three pigs to butcher by fall. Now how do I make good on that promise? I'm not one to go back on my word, but I have no way to pay for the produce we've been getting for months now. There was grumbling and complaining from the crowd about the major and how he was operating. Stillman and his men gotta go, Carl, one of the men shouted. Shots rang out from outside. Carl and the others spilled out from the barn to investigate. Zeb and Zack were standing in the driveway, facing Major Stillman and a dozen of his soldiers. Their dog Roy, a seven-year-old, 120-pound male German shepherd, lay dead in the driveway. When Carl saw this, his blood boiled over. What happened here? Who did this? he demanded. Major Stillman stepped out of his jeep and walked toward Carl. This dog was in the process of attacking my men, Constable. I did it in their defense. Zeb yelled to his dad, That's a lie! Roy just stood up when they rode up. He was growling, but I ordered him to stand down, and he was obeying. He was standing in front of me and Zack, Dad. He wasn't attacking anyone. Carl started for Stillman. Two soldiers blocked his path and readied their rifles, pointing them at Carl and pulling back the charging handles. Carl stopped. He looked at Major Stillman. You are all trespassing here. This is private property. Leave now. Major Stillman interrupted. Or what, Constable? Just what do you think you are going to do? I've had just about all I'm planning on taking from you, Fairley. He held the hand in the air, and the rest of his men formed a line on him facing Carl. Zack ran over to their dead pet, laying on the driveway. As he did, one of the soldiers pointed his rifle at him. Carl ran to stand between them and yelled, No! Stillman put his hand on the rifle barrel lowering it toward the ground. Stand easy, soldier, he ordered. Carl was fuming, and Stillman could see it. He could feel it. He looked around. What's this now, having another meeting? I hear you've been doing a lot of talking, Constable. Seems you have some real plans for this region, huh? Stirring up some real trouble lately. Well, we'll see how big your talk is after today. He waved his hand in a circle and three of the soldiers moved toward the barn. They began to shoot all the livestock that they came across. Abigail ran from the house yelling for them to stop. One of the soldiers turned and backhanded her across the face. She fell backward onto the ground. Carl started to run toward her, and three soldiers held him in restraint. He was screaming at Stillman and struggling to break free from the soldiers. Stillman walked up and got right in Carl's face. Not so tough now, are you, Constable? The door to the house opened, and Carl yelled for the girls to stay inside. Stillman told the men outside the barn 
who were held in position by several armed soldiers, to quietly and peacefully disperse. Hollis Bellows looked over at Carl. Carl nodded, signaling for them to comply with Stillman's order. Stillman shouted at him, Don't look to him for approval. I ordered you all to disperse. I'm the law here now. Don't make me give the order again. The men started for their vehicles. Stillman nodded at one of his soldiers, who smashed his rifle butt against the back of Bellows' head as he walked by. Hollis fell to the ground unconscious. The next time one of you heroes looks to Mr. Fairley for confirmation to an order that I issue, it will be worse than that. Then Stillman signaled to another soldier, who then took a bottle filled with gasoline with a rag sticking out from it. From the back of one of the jeeps, he lit it and he threw it into the barn. It exploded on impact and the barn began to burn. Stillman's men held Carl and the others at gunpoint and made them watch as the barn burned to the ground. Stillman bound the man's hands behind their backs and lined them up before him on their knees. You are all enemies of the state, he declared. As such, you're all under arrest. Then he walked over and stood in front of Carl. Carl Fairley, you are charged with sedition, an act of treason which is punishable by death. He said it loud enough for all to clearly hear. He paced back and forth and paused briefly for dramatic effect. As the chief government officer in this region, I will act as the judge in this matter. Carl Fairley, I find you guilty of treason by acts of sedition against this administration. Abigail was crying hysterically and pleaded with Stillman not to hurt Carl. Carl Fairley, you're sentenced to die for your crimes. He looked at the soldier standing over Carl and nodded at him. He pointed his sidearm up at Carl's head. Abigail screamed, No! Three shots rang out in less than two seconds' time. The soldier pointing the gun at Carl dropped first, then the one to his left, and finally the one next to him. Simultaneously, Four shots hit soldiers in the other end of the line. Before another shot could be fired, the remaining soldiers scrambled for cover. Carl rolled over on his side, swept his leg around, striking Major Stillman behind the knees. His knee buckled and he fell to the ground, inches away from Carl. As Stillman drew his sidearm... Carl rolled over on his back, wrapped his legs around Stillman's neck. He tightened his thigh and calf muscles with all his strength and jerked his legs to one side. Major Stillman's neck snapped. It was a clean break, and he was dead before his head hit the ground. The five remaining soldiers tried to ascertain where the shots were being fired from. In that process, three more were killed. The remaining two laid down their rifles in the dirt and surrendered. The two Section 7 security operators never came out from their positions or showed themselves at all. Abigail ran over and cut the ties that bound Carl's hands, and he in turn freed the others and secured the two prisoners. Carl looked around. He saw that the barn, fully engulfed in flames now, was too far gone to save. He yelled to Abigail to gather the children. Bug out bags, sidearms, and rifles, he spun around and called to Zeb. Pack as many horses as you can, priorities, food, water, and medical, firearms, and ammo. He looked over at Hollis Bellows. Nobody but these two soldiers can identify any of you. 
I'll take care of them. You and the rest of this group go into the basement. Take as many of the supplies as you can carry. I'll be in contact with you through the church and Pastor Sharps. He walked over close to Bellows and quietly told him, Look, Hollis, I'm sorry this happened. Talk to the others. Anyone who doesn't want any part of what's about to happen can walk away now with no questions asked. Nobody knows who any of you are or who was here. You all can go back to your lives if you want to. Please, just drop off as much of my stored preps at the church as you can. I'll get it there at some point. I don't blame anyone for walking away, Hollis. Really, I understand completely. We got to hurry now. I appreciate your help with this. Okay, Carl, I'll tell the others. I can't speak for anyone else, but I'm not backing down. Me and my boy talked about this before we even came out here. We're in it with you wherever it goes, brother. Don't worry about your supplies. We'll secure them and get them to the church and wait for you to contact us. Thanks, Hollis. We'll talk soon. Abigail and the girls came out. They each had a backpack on and were carrying a duffel bag. They loaded up and mounted the horses that Zeb and Zack had saddled and waiting. Within less than 20 minutes from getting the direction from Carl, his family was packed, loaded, and riding away from the homestead. They had the two soldiers with them as prisoners. As they passed the gate, Carl looked up and saw the two Section 7 security operators standing on a rock outcropping just outside the tree line. The one closest to him raised his rifle, and as Carl acknowledged them, they turned and rode off into the forest. Carl and his family would meet up with them again at their cabin outpost high in the mountains later this evening. He felt secure, knowing that they would be watching and following closely.